at Tepu. Peace and blessings. It's Mut Imani of Hatep Meditation and Yoga. Reading another chapter of Poser by Claire Didera. Chapter 1 Triangle. Creamy and flushed and covered with fuzz, our baby daughter was like a delicious peach. <laughs> Only much heavier. Even though I fed her on a diet of breast milk and nothing else, she grew fatter and fatter. She was dense with good health. The story of how I nursed my daughter has a catch-22 ending. The child was thriving on this milky, unending flow of a food designed perfectly for her. When she was 10 months old, I began to feel like we might weigh about the same amount. I would haul her onto my lap and she would gaze up at me with delight. And in the... <clears throat> in the parlance of the day, latch on. I would gaze back at her, amazed that I could so easily satisfy another creature. She was intent and, and happy as she suckled away. I remember those days. The only problem with the baby was that when I held her in my lap for these marathon feedings, she was crushing something crucial inside me. Maybe my spleen, or possibly something larger. I tried lying on my side to nurse her, but she required so much food provided in such lengthy sessions that this wasn't really tenable. The milk was making her so healthy that it was getting harder and harder to actually deliver the milk to her. That's the catch-22 part. Cast my mind back to, cast your mind back to the late 1990s for just a moment. Nursing at least where we lived in Seattle was a strange combination of enthusiast hobby and moral mandate. I remember that. Drive 30 miles to the north where my husband's cousins lived in suburbia and you'd find mothers happily plugging a bottle of formula into their baby squalling mouths. In Seattle, only full-time working mothers gave their babies bottles, or rather, their nannies did. And those bottles were filled with the mother's very own milk, expressed through a breast pump. Weaning wasn't allowed until at least one year. This was by the consensus of who, exactly? Us? We were the mothers with books. We looked things up. We knew stuff. Like, for example, that the American Academy of Pediatrics said that at least one year of nursing was optimal for the baby's immune system and brain development. For the kind of mothers that we were, optimal meant mandatory. And one year meant <laughs> a few. <laughs> Seattle, at that time, was a town where little dudes strolled up to their moms at the playground for a quick top off, said, thanks, babe, and rejoined the soccer match. <laughs> I wasn't that bad. 14 months was my limit. Lucy wasn't yet 10 months, and I wasn't supposed to quit nursing until at least a year. If you think that sounds like a frivolous dilemma <laughs> or not worth losing sleep over, then that just goes to show you were not a new mother in a liberal enclave at the end of the last century. While I debated whether or not to wean her and Bruce, my husband, <laughs> feigned interest, the inevitable occurred. My back went out. The middle of my back pinched me all the time, like a salacious old man. I couldn't sit in a straight chair. I couldn't lie flat on the couch. I couldn't lift the groceries, so I weaned her. Now that I've been doing yoga for 10 years, I'm tempted to say something wise, such as, I was ready to wean and my body made the decision for me. But back then, I didn't believe in that kind of crap. Instead, I paddled around in a complicated gumbo of guilt and relief. I claimed to feel cheated of my full, God-given, federally mandated year of nursing. 
I apologize to my husband for my subpar performance. I told my friends, oh no, I can't nurse the baby. Inside, I secretly exulted. I had my spleen to myself again. We lived in Finney Ridge, a North Seattle neighborhood filled with educated, white, liberal, well-intentioned people, which pretty much describes all North Seattle neighborhoods. Finney Ridge is notable for being even more liberal and even better intention than most. In Finney Ridge, people don't have beware of dog signs. They have please be mindful of dog signs. When I complained about my back, which I did often, and with gusto, the people of Finney Ridge all had the same answer, do yoga. The doctor said, there are poses that will strengthen your back. The checker at Ken's Market told me I could buy a good yoga video at a nearby New Age bookstore. The homeless guy selling the homeless guy newspaper outside Ken's Market said, be sure to get a mat. It's really hard to do yoga without a mat. He was right though. I had a number of preconceptions about yoga. Mm -hmm. I thought yoga was done by self-indulgent middle-aged ladies with a lot of time on their hands or by skinny, fanatical, 22-year-old vegetarian former gymnasts. I was also unsettled by the notion of white people seeking transformation through the customs of a brown-skinned people, basically, to my mind, a suspect dynamic. Despite these sloppily thought out but strongly held reservations, my specialty, I had suspected for years that I probably ought to do yoga. I was a nervous kind of person, a self-conscious, hair-adjusting kind of person, a person who practically burned with worried energy. I had a constant tremor in my hands so that the whole world knew how anxious I was. Just a couple of weeks earlier, I had been hanging out at a coffee shop feeding Lucy bits of cracker and navigating the coffee cup from the saucer to my mouth with trembling hand. A gentleman approached and introduced himself to me as an energy shaman. Before I could think of a way to get rid of him, he took my shaking hand in his and pronounced gravely, you could use a lot of work. Oh, I said, grinning nervously, I'm sorry, I just, I have this tremor that I've had since I was a little kid and I'm not getting a lot of sleep because of the baby and I guess I've had a lot of coffee I concluded lamely do you eat a lot of chicken he asked that can cause energy problems I stood up spilling my coffee and swiftly loaded Lucy into her stroller well goodbye I waved cheerfully and left the cafe fairly thrumming with energy problems Yoga seemed like just exactly what I wanted, something to calm me down. I also seemed, it also seemed just exactly what I didn't want, a place where everyone could see what a mess I was, could see my tremor and my anxiety and my worry. There was something about holding still, about inhabiting a pose that was scary. What was under all that ang anxious chatter what was under all that anxious chatter? But now things but now things were different. I had a baby. It was imperative that I be able to lift her. I would do anything to be able to lift her. Yoga class, however, was beyond me. Like everyone else, I was terrified of a room full of people who were good at it. Little did I know then what only very occasionally in yoga that only occasionally in yoga do you stumble into an entire room full of people who are good at it. That's what I had to learn. And when you do, they often turn out to be assholes. That's another story. I figured a video would be the best approach. Maybe I could get the benefits without all the pesky humiliation. On an Indian summer afternoon, I decided to head over to the New Age bookstore. Amid much pension, I wrangled the baby into a stroller. This engendered another form of mother guilt. 
recent strollers recently strollers had come under the North Seattle mother's list of banned substances. Apparently, the baby felt alienated so far away from its mother and preferred to be snuggled up against the mother's back or <laughs> there was no escaping its perone like hegemony, her breast. You were supposed to strap your baby into a sling or a snuggly, known around our house as a smuggly. There was some theory about the baby wanting to see the world from the same perspective as its mother, which looks crazy as I type it, but that was the argument. I remember we had a huge snuggly when they first came out. We put the oldest child in, we put the oldest child in the stroller and the youngest child in the snuggly. And Seku usually wore it. At any rate, putting your child on a stroller was fast becoming yet another way of letting the world know that A, you didn't really love your kid, and B, you were an uneducated dumb shit. That was all well and good for people with those lightweight babies made from balsa wood, but my pleasingly substantial daughter and I were devoted to strolling. And so we made our way through the fall afternoon to the bookshop. The baby graciously tolerated her dumb shit, unloving mother. I had walked by the New Age bookshop many times, but had never gone in. Wrestling the stroller through the door, I was hit with the ecclesiastically grubby smell of incense. She said, not me. Everything in the store was dusty and slightly off plumb. The magazine racks tilted. The books were piled haphazardly. The posters of chakras and mushrooms and stars were at various subtle angles. I found a teetering wire rack of yoga videos. Some of the people on the covers were orange. Mm. Some wore headbands. Some were peeking out from behind swirling, vaguely medieval purple writing. I chose a beginning Yo yoga tape. It looked safe. The woman on the cover was not orange and she wore no headgear. The graphics did not look as if they'd been drawn up in an asylum. I located a yoga mat and paid. And then the baby and I got the hell out of there. That night, Bruce gave her a bottle to which she had adapted nicely. Thanks. And I went into the room with the TV which like everyone in Finney Ridge, we refused to call the TV room. I put on my tape. The blonde woman gazed into the camera from her serene world, a place where potted orchids thrived. There was some discussion about not overdoing it and going at your own speed. And then the yoga session was underway. The woman sat there with her eyes shut. I sat there looking at her. Apparently, we were warming up. This pleasant state of affairs continued for a while. Unfortunately, soon it was time to do asana. This had a forbidding sound. Jump your feet about three feet apart on the mat, said the blonde lady. This I did. Turn your left foot in about 45 degrees and your right foot out. Done and done. Check me out. Extend right hand over the right foot and gently rest the hand on the shin, the ankle, or the foot, wherever it's most comfortable. Tippy, but I was on it. Slowly rotate your torso upward and extend your left arm toward the ceiling. And I'm out. <laughs> I sat down with the thud and watched the woman with her strangely unshifting expression. She was a puddle on a windless day. In a calm voice, the way you talk to old people when you're convinced, <laughs> when you're convincing them to take a few steps across the hospital room to use the bathroom, she said, tri ko na sa na She lingered on the word, obviously enjoying the sound of the, what was it? Sanskrit? Triangle pose, she translated. 
I rewound the tape and I tried again. Right leg out, feet turned at a, <laughs> an angle, extend right arm, drop right hand to right shin. I started to worry. How was I going to get that left arm up? How was I going to turn my torso? Whole shit, now or never. I flung my left arm into the air and twisted my torso, <laughs> maybe a millimeter up, pinch. I caught a glimpse of myself reflected in the darkened window. I was hunched up like, it's Pat from Saturday Night Live. I rewound the tape again and followed the directions again and ended up <clears throat> again bunched in an odd shape. I could feel parts of my body bumping together that had never bumped before. Something hurt. I had a feeling it wasn't supposed to hurt. Looking back, I can see that I had just learned a paramount yoga lesson. Get a good teacher, or at least a live one. My back still hurt, and though muscle relaxants exerted a powerful allure, the muscle relaxant lifestyle was not really doable for me. I made my living as a book reviewer. A terrible idea, by the way. When I took muscle relaxants, the novels I read for review tended to improve dramatically. Since my critical faculties were really all I had going for me, I reluctantly went drug free. There was this notion in my mind that somehow yoga was going to make me better. Better than I'd been. Better than everyone else. More virtuous. I liked the idea of myself as a yoga person. I could not bring myself to say yogi or yogini. Live, probably thin, with some kind of ineffable glow, and my back wouldn't hurt. Clearly, it was time to try an actual yoga class. The following week, on a rainy October day, I left the baby with my mother and drove across town to the yoga studio my friend Katrina went to. Katrina was sort of nutty, but she, did, she had a gorgeous ass. So I thought, what the hell? Inside the front door of the studio was an entry vestibule, decorated in the style of, don't be afraid, we're not a cult. <laughs> the walls were painted white and screened with tasteful shoji panels. The blonde wood floor was uncarpeted and spotless. Neat cubbies, a weighted shoes, all was white and clean, as though the room had been designed for surgery or Swedish people. The only spot of color came from the Tibetan prayer flags strung over the doorway into the studio. In flagrant defiance of my long time policy of never entering a structure adorned with Tibetan prayer flags, I don't know, I removed my shoes, paid my 10 bucks to the wan girl at the desk and walked into the studio where eight or ten young women were sitting on their mats. Even though they were there for a beginner class, they all looked incredibly fit and somewhat stern. Oh, she taking me back. Their ponytails <clears throat> were glossy and neat. Those ponytails were ready for business. The women sat cross-legged with straight backs. They all gazed straight ahead into the middle distance as if they were about to break out into a collective fit of landscape painting. <laughs> I smiled apologetically. This is my worst habit and I hope to break it by the time I'm 80. When I'm an old lady, I'll finally be able to swagger into a room with a fuck you attitude. I laid out my mat and sat on it. I felt the onset of the deep sorrow that maybe peculi peculiarly to me precedes any new physical undertaking. I, I, had, I have never been good at sports. I always feel like a spectator, even when I'm in the middle of a game. Yes, indeed. 
The shoji screens filtered the light from the vestibule, spreading it on the floor in a grid. My sense of futility grew larger. I looked at the serene ladies and wondered if they really believed that enlightenment would find us here in a drafty room in a strip mall in North Seattle. As I looked around at the fair-skinned women and the prayer flags over the door and the little altar in the corner, my preconceptions about yoga seemed immediately and all too amply confirmed. The scene was the very picture of white female self-indulgence. There were no Indian people in this room. That was certain. A woman in her late 20s entered and rolled out her mat in front of us. Her thick blonde hair was cut in an expensive bob. Her eyebrows were fancily mowed. Her outfit was black and tight. She looked as though she had been a step aerobics teacher until about five minutes ago. She looked like her name was Jennifer. I am Atosha, she said, like hell you are, sister. Come to a comfortable sitting position, she said. Please bring your fingers into the Guyana Mudra. Mudra is the yoga of the hands. She made a circle with the thumb and forefinger on each hand, and I followed suit. It felt corny, but sort of wonderful at the same time. My hands looked enlightened. We will begin the class with one long ohm, Atosha intoned. Breathe in and ohm on the exhalation. I sneak peeks around the room. The other women look peaceful and relaxed, as if they were in an ad for bubble bath. I breathed in and let out my ohm, which came in a wheezy gasp. Atosha's ohm boomed and wavered beautifully. The ohm travels up from the seat, through the heart, and out the top of the head. It passes through all the chakras. Atosha listed all the chakras by name, location, and color. Yoga seemed to involve a lot of talking. We did a series of wildly uncomfortable movements that I know now recognize to be sun salutation A. We reached for the sky, we touched our toes, we lunged one leg back, then we pulled back into downward dog. Both hands on the floor, both feet on the floor, bottom jutting up toward the ceiling. We lunged again, <laughs> touched our toes again, and there we were, where we started, reaching for the sky. I was red, and breathing hard and trembling. Yes, indeed, I remember that. <laughs> As we sat into a deep runner's, sank into a deep runner's lunge, Atosha looked at me with worry. It wasn't, I'm worried about you, worry. It was, I don't need anyone collapsing in my class, worry. <laughs> you need blocks, she said abruptly. She got some foam blocks from a shelf and had me Prop my hands on them. She kept an eager eye on me. We were going to work on Trikonasana today. We're going to work on Trikonasana today, she said. My nemesis. I remember how scared I was of falling and hitting the back of my head or knocking my teeth out. And that fear has not left me yet. Please turn your mats so they're perpendicular to mine. Jump your feet about three feet. Jump your feet apart about three feet, she said. And then we were off to the races. We did trikonasana over and over at the wall, in the corner of the room, with a partner pulling on your front arm. Each time I bunched up like a cluster of grapes. I shook. I sweated. I clenched. It was exactly as I had always suspected. Yoga was a kind of magnifier for my limitations. Hmm. Triangle was especially baffling because it was, in essence, so simple. You stood with your feet apart and rested your hand on your shin, easy as pie, except it wasn't. Even pie itself is not that easy if you make your own crust. There seemed to be an infinite number of ways to get it wrong. 
Atosha began to lecture us. Mm. Well, actually, she began to lecture me. <laughs> I remember that. Think extension. The pose is about creating space. I thought extension. I tried to create space. I bunched. At the end of class, we all lay flat on our backs in Shavasana, or corpse pose, sprawled loosely with our arms at our sides. Even this seemed painful beyond my reach. Even this seemed painfully beyond my reach. My eyes were shut tight, but I could sense a Tosha looking at me, noticing my tensed shoulders, my knit brow, my clenched jaw. Finally, we sat up. Atosha led the class in a final ohm and said that if anyone had questions to feel free to approach her after class. I took her at a word. More fool I. <laughs> yes, she said, raising a perfectly shaped eyebrow. Uh, I was wondering if you could help me with triangle. Oh, you mean trikonasana? She asked. Yes, trikonasana. Well, you just need more extension. Here, look at this. She stepped into a beautiful shape, legs angling apart, torso twisted gracefully, eyes gazing upward as if she could see infinity beyond the acoustic tiles. She jumped back to standing. See, she said brightly, I was reminded of Julie Peterson showing off her cartwheel in first grade. I gave it a go. No, she said. Try extending your trunk more. You're too hunched. I smiled apologetically at her and said, I'll work on it. And I left. I remember the first time the first week of yoga classes for me, the meditation at, the, at Shavasana was so beautiful and so affirming and so, so much what I needed that I started crying. Didn't care. <laughs> it was just the teacher and me in the classroom, and I didn't care. It was the first time that someone told me that I was good enough in a long time other than Sekou. I never wanted to see Atosha again. Just in a in a just world, she wouldn't be she would have been deported. <laughs> Maybe to an island populated by fully extended human beings. Even so, for some reason I still wanted to try yoga. The next week I noticed a little storefront yoga place near my house. It didn't look like much. It had a stylized brush stroke drawing of a yogi. Or was it a Buddha? on its logo. I didn't want to do yoga in a place that looked like a half-ass noodle joint. Nonetheless, it was only five minutes away and offered a beginner class at 7 p.m., which was the time of day when I customarily began, began to be alert and look around and notice things. I thought I'd give it a try. It was dark by the time I got there, and the foyer to the studio was a pool of cheerful yellow light. I approached the desk, which was manned by a serious looking fellow with a dork knob. <laughs> I think she means ponytail. <laughs> My heart sank. After a Tosha, I couldn't take any more cold-hearted uh, grooviness. <laughs> I introduced myself and gave him my 10 bucks. Welcome, he said ominously. Vincent Price in a tank top. <laughs> I went into the studio. The room was filled with not girls, which is to say there were all kinds of people there. A few young men in workout gear and two older women in stretchy purple lycra and a couple of slightly lumpy women my own age.
clearly moms. All but lactating through their leotards. And one old fellow who was wearing jeans and a leather belt. A leather belt. <laughs> Even I knew better than that. I enjoyed a nanosecond of feeling superior, <laughs> but was thrown off guard when the students turned and smiled and said hello. In all my days, well, day of yoga going, I had never seen anything like it. Most of the time when I worked on uh, walking into my first studio, uh, which was predominantly white, I was the one saying hello and sometimes people spoke back and sometimes they treated me like I was invisible Dorknob came in he sat down silently and I got myself ready for some more vague sanctimonies instead he looked around the room and smiled something in him lit up like there was a big switch on his back that had just been flipped on he started laughing because he started laughing before he started speaking. Hi, I'm Jonathan, he said. Beginning is hard, but it's also lucky because you have the chance to build something beautiful from the ground up with no old mistakes, no old habits. I know now that this was basic yoga boilerplate but the thing was Jonathan really believed it he finished the speech and laughed again like can you believe we're all doing this crazy thing in this room together I looked around everyone was smiling we sat and breathed for a while then Jonathan popped up and said tonight we're going to work on triangles I got ready for the bossing. First, we would jump our feet apart. Then we would try to extend, whatever that meant. And then I would look like, it's Pat. And then the teacher would frown at me. All righty. Jonathan did have us spread our feet apart, but we didn't jump. We just lazily separated them. Once our feet were positioned, he said, we're going to work at angling our hips. That's all triangle really is. It's a hip position. His right foot was in the leading position. He cocked his left hip <clears throat> to the left and said with excitement, look, see how the simple action of pulling your left hip back creates a crease between the top of the right thigh and the hip, that crease is what we want. That's where triangle comes from. We all cocked our left hips as one, we gazed down at our thighs and lo, there were creases. We beamed <laughs> Look at those hip creases. That is triangle, said Jonathan. He looked genuinely happy for us. You are doing it. You can add more. You can extend your right arm out over your right leg and drop the hand and turn the body and raise the left arm to, to the ceiling. But those are all additions. You are doing triangle right now. I caught my left hip over and over again and watched that crease appear. I had been living inside my body more than 30 years and it was showing me a shape I had never witnessed before. That sense of doing something that you never thought you could do. <laughs> to me, back in 08, that was enlightenment. After a while, we tried gesturing forward 
with our right arm. I, I misspoke. I started as a student in 07. I became a teacher in 08. After a while, we tried gesturing toward forward with our right arm. It felt great, like the movement was growing from that creased hip. <laughs> then we dropped our right hands. Just anywhere, said Jonathan, anywhere that feels good. Mine landed on my knee. We turned our bodies gently and then we raised our left arm as best we could. Mine was not exactly straight up. It was in the gentle direction of up. It was the beginning of up. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Jonathan walked around the room looking at us. He stopped by me and said, try pressing the little toe of your back foot I tried it, and all of a sudden, the pose made more sense to me. I was able, or abler, to understand what I was doing, and didn't feel quite so much like I was at war with my own body. I was amazed by the change. It was like having someone show you that you could fix a car's crankshaft by adjusting the side mirror. Here was a place where someone would tell me what to do, and there were identifiable results. Unlike motherhood, where the rules seemed to shift all the time, not just motherhood, and standards seemed as high as the moon. <laughs> of course, this was no different from what happened at any exercise class. At step aerobics, for instance, they were only too happy to tell you what to do and had the headsets to prove it. But I intuited or guessed or, let's be honest, devoutly hoped that in yoga there was another outcome. You would do what they said and you would be better. Yoga would allay my anxiety by teaching me to breathe and relax, but it would also allay my anxiety by teaching, but it would also allay my anxiety by elevating me to a more superior evolved state of being where I would no longer have to worry about whether or not I was doing everything right. I had the sense of mind to know that my overeating was because of my emotions not feeling good enough and that I was going to kill myself unless I did something to change that mindset and I was intuitive enough to know that it was yoga just the beginning Jonathan continued Imagine your body is being pressed between two huge panes of glass. Gently pressed, of course. I tried to imagine this. It seems sort of silly. I remember that. <laughs> Thinking, my butt and my belly won't let me be pressed between two panes of glass. <laughs> Jonathan went on. <clears throat> This plane, this space between the two imaginary panes of glass is called the coronal plane. You want to keep your body inside this plane while you do the pose. Don't lean your torso forward or let your behind stick out. Keep it within this coronal plane. This seemed like some pointless piece of information I had ever heard. This seemed like the most pointless piece of information I had ever heard. In fact, triangle itself was an exercise in pointlessness. She said it. Who could imagine herself into being a triangle? It brought to mind that old 
They Might Be Giants song about Triangle Man who goes around beating people up. Maybe that song was secretly about yoga. These thoughts ran through my mind as I tried to fit myself into a triangle. At the same time, Jonathan spoke with such confidence as though the coronal plane and fitting oneself into it were crucial information. Maybe he was right. Anyway, I couldn't quit now. I just stood there and held the pose. This small submission would yield huge and strange returns that would reverberate across the next few years. Yoga had come into my life with its strange, unknowable, even funny logic. For good or for ill, it had arrived. What the hell, I thought as I extended my hand toward the sky and creased my hip and tried to fit myself into the coronal plane. At the end of class, we lay in Shavasana. I felt tired and content. Maybe that's why I cried the first, the first week. I, <clears throat> the immobility had a pastoral quality to it, as if trees swayed overhead. Jonathan's voice was quiet now. Thank you for sharing this evening with me. In yoga, we say namaste, which means I bow to the divine in you. He bowed his dork knobbed head and said namaste. We bowed back and mumbled namaste. On my tongue, the new word felt as though it contained its own foreign spice. That's the end of chapter one. Now, let's practice triangle pose. There won't be any jumping, your feet apart. If I wanted to jump, I would have taken aerobics. Let's warm the feet up first. Extend them out. <clears throat> Sit up tall. Relax the shoulders down from your earlobes. Um, have a micro bend in your knees or put your rolled up towel, rolled up blanket or a meditation cushion under those knees to create that micro bend. Draw your navel in to tell your uh, core muscles that uh, you're going to sit up straight and they're going to have to do the work instead of your low back. Let's tune into the breath. Put your hands where it's comfortable. On your lap, at your sides, behind you, anywhere. Sit up tall. Breathe in and breathe out. In through the nose, out through the mouth, out, out through the nose or mouth. Let the body relax so that when you inhale, your abdomen inflates a little bit, that air travels up, you feel your spine lengthen as your heart lifts. Maybe you feel the top of your head lift. Maybe you feel your tailbone lengthen down into your mat. And as you exhale, draw your navel in a little bit more and let your shoulders slide down your back, away from your ears. Let your hips sink more into your mat. <sighs> oh. 
but we're going to wake up the feet, the ankles, and the legs. As you inhale, point your toes away from you. As you exhale, draw in your navel and point your toes up or towards you. Inhale, point. Exhale, flex. Inhale, point. Exhale, flex. So let's do that three times. Follow your breath. Slow inhale, slow exhale. Circle the ankles. Both feet can go in the same direction or they can go in opposite directions. But still breathe mindfully. Slow inhale, slow exhale. Big exaggerated circles. I hope y'all can't hear the popping. Re reverse. I hear it. Walking. Walking, walking, walking. Opposite directions. Reverse. <sighs> Gentle forward fold. Relax those shoulders down. Draw the navel in as you exhale. Tuck your chin a little bit. Just another breath. Chin, to, chin down as we come up. Shoulders come over. Work the shoulders. Warm them up. Inhale, lift them up. Exhale, let them slowly drift down. Two times more. Let's go for three. This is perfectly okay if you don't feel coordinated enough to do the, uh, the shoulder circles. Inhale them forward. Exhale them back. Inhale them forward. Exhale them back. And let's reverse it. Inhale them back. Exhale them forward. Inhale back. Exhale forward. Mm. Inhale, look up. Mmm. Feels so good. Draw in the navel. Exhale them. Look down. Two more. Inhale, slow. Draw the navel in. Exhale, slow. One more. Inhale. Navel in as we exhale. Mm -mm -mm. Feels so good. A little bit to wake up the arms. <clears throat> Reach forward on the inhale. Bend the elbows on the exhale. Inhale. Spread the fingers wide. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Three more, use your breath, just keep it slow. All right, let's bring <clears throat> left foot onto the right thigh, flex the foot a little bit. Take the fingers, put a finger in between each toe. And just do a little point and flex, massaging the toes. And a little gentle circle, one or two in each direction. Inhale, sit up tall, drawing your navel as you exhale. And fold forward just a tiny bit. See if you can feel a little stretch in the hip joints. 
This is a variation of Pigeon Pose. <sighs> Relax those shoulders down. Let the heart stay lifted. Inhale, draw in the navel. Exhale. Look over the toes or look down at the shin. Both feet are gently flexed. Tuck your chin, come on up. Lift that leg, rock it, baby. Hold on wherever you can hold on. This left, this left hip has a uh, 15 plus year old injury to it. So it's always creaky. Which is why I take magnesium. <sighs> Put it back down. Switch it up. Right foot. Right ankle comes to left thigh. Gently flex the feet. Left hand. Fingers between each toe. Toes want to give you some resistance. Gently get them in there. Breathe mindfully. Flex and point, point and flex the toes. Gently circle them. Mainly the toes, not necessarily the ankle. All right. Sit up tall. On the inhale, draw in the navel and fold forward on the exhale. Doesn't have to be far. Just far enough so that you can maybe feel a little stretch in that hip. <sighs> Tuck your chin. Look at your toes. Look at your shin. If you got your eyes open. Relax your shoulders down. Tuck your chin. Inhale yourself back up. Exhale your shoulders down. Pick up your shin any way you can. Grab any way you can. And rock the baby. Gently. Just want to warm up the hip joint. Support the knee. Got old knee injuries from different years. Always nurturing the hip joints and the knee joints. Set it down. Stretch it out. Shake the knees out. Which is hard with this cushion, but... Shake the knees out. Stiffness in the neck. Try to relieve that. Turn left. Uh, right. Turn left. And I feel my neck crunching up. I look to the side. Or up and down. All right, move the cushion out the way till we need it as a prop. Swing those legs to the side. If you need to stretch any more for your back, there's always cat cow. Inhale, heart forward, tailbone lifts. Exhale, tailbone tucks, navel draws in, chin tucks. Back of the heart lifts toward the heaven. Inhale, heart forward, gaze forward, tailbone up. Exhale, tuck everything. 
and reach the back of the heart up. Fingers are spread wide. One more. Mm, 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 mm. So, so, so good. Woo. Flat back, navel in. Let's take a twist. Just turn a little bit. Turn a little bit and look at your heel or your, or your toes. When you feel like you've warmed up enough, come on and stand up. Take your time getting up. This is your practice. Triangle pose. First, <clears throat> first one from um, facing you. We stand in mountain pose. Lift up those toes and spread them out as if our fingers are still in between them. And put them back down. This is to form your good base. Standing uh, hip joint distance apart is like putting your two fists together and, and, and putting them down and seeing if, um, if your feet are about that distance apart. If that still feels tight on um, stiff hip joints, then step a little bit wider, about shoulder distance apart. But I'm going to try hip distance this time. <clears throat> Make sure I have enough room. <sighs> when you're ready, inhale the spine long. Draw in your navel. You got a micro bend in your knees. Your shoulders are down. Your tailbone is tucked under. Inhale and feel your spine feel your spine lengthen up through the crown of the head and down through the tailbone all the way to the soles of your feet. As you exhale, draw your navel in and step your right foot back. Turn the toes <clears throat> out to an angle. Step the front foot a little wider if you need to. <clears throat> Turn to the side. Inhale the arms out. Cock that left, uh, uh, that right hip towards your feet and reach your right, your left hand forward. And then down to the shin. Let the back hand lift up. You can look straight ahead or up. Sometimes when you look up, that's when you get wobbly. Even easier, stand at the wall. Both feet <clears throat> pointing straight out. Turn the left one forward. This one's already at an angle. Inhale the arms out to the side. Cock that hip back toward the back foot while reaching the front hand toward the front foot. And then slowly lower down to your knee. As in the book, turn your head forward or up. If you can reach the shin, then reach the shin. If you can reach the ankle, then reach the anchor. Let your butt hit, touch the wall. That's your plane of glass. Or to the ground. Don't let your knees lock. Micro bend. Look down when you're ready to come up. Come up in stages. Triangle pose. 
That's one way to do it. Another way is to use the wall. Again, with your hand touching the wall. Foot to the wall, back foot. At an angle, the hip cocks back toward the back foot. Arm reaches up or out, and you lean into it. Try not to lock that front knee or the back knee. Press the back edge, the outer edge of the back foot into the, into the earth. This is also a triangle pose. Come on up. Bend that knee. Whatever you do on one side, do on the other side. Back foot at an angle, at a 90 degree angle. <clears throat> Turn the front foot the other way. Butt against the wall if you're not feeling stable today. It's early in the morning here. Inhale the arms up. Cock the hip back toward the back foot. Reach the front arm forward. Inhale, relax through the shoulders, draw in your navel, exhale, and touch down. But rest on the wall. Hand to the knee, to the shin, to the ankle, or to the ground. Don't lock the knees. They will be hurting and screaming after a while. Gaze forward. Looking at my plants that's doing their thing, or a good gaze up. When you're ready to come out of it, look down. Then you need to need to come on up. If holding the uh, back arm up is a problem, then don't hold it up. Put your hands on your hips. Let the backbone slip. <laughs> this, this, since this foot is by the wall, it'll be the back foot. Turn this foot forward toward the plants. Hands on the hip. Cock that hip back. Reach this arm forward. Down to the knee. Or the shin or the ankle or the earth reach your shoulders toward the ceiling your top shoulder toward the ceiling and your bottom shoulder toward the earth balance it out look forward how y'all doing or look up and you don't have to worry about looking at your fingertips look up at the sky or look forward. If your neck is stiff, don't look up at the sky. Look forward. But when you're ready to come out of it, look down and ease your way out of it. I'm sweating. But I got to do the other side. This is going to be the back foot. This is going to be the front foot. Hand on the hip. Micro bend in the knee. Cock the hip toward the back foot. Reach the hand forward. Inhale. Lengthen. Draw your navel in a little bit more. And as you exhale, 
slide on down to the knee, to the shin, to the ankle. This side want to act up. Touch the ball if you need to. Keep looking forward if your neck is stiff. Point this shoulder to the, toward the heavens. Point this shoulder toward the earth. Let yourself relax into the pose. Listen to your body. What does it need? Mm. When you're ready, look down and ease up out of the pose. Yoga practice doesn't have to be hard. We make it hard. By thinking ourselves as limited. We have to remember that we are limitless beings. We have limit, limit, limitless potential. It truly is mind over matter. The mind part is believing in yourself. The matter part is all of the negative uh, self-talk. Negativity from others that we have to let go of. And that is one of the greatest things that yoga has brought to my life. I went from thinking that I was never going to be good enough to knowing that I am. Next time we will read an, uh, chapter 2 of Poser. My Life in 23 Yoga Poses by Claire Didera. Let's end in oneness by chanting OM. If you're not comfortable with OM, then hum or remain silent and listen to the vibrations within yourself and all around you, which you are one with. Bring the hands together. Press the thumbs into the center of the chest, the location of the spiritual heart. <sighs> Take a slow, deep inhale. Let your heart lift. Let your crown lift. Let your tailbone, legs, and feet ground. And as you exhale, let the sound, if there is any, come forth on its own. yourself of that. Remind others of that. Inhale one more time. Let your heart lift to meet your namaste. Draw your navel in and as you bow towards your hands, exhale. Namaste. Ajay Ashe. Meriya. Much love from Accept meditation and yoga. Thank you for sharing my practice. I hope to see you again next time. For another chapter of Poser. My Life in 23 Yoga Poses by Claire Didera. Peace and blessings.